Okay, so it's my great pleasure to have Michael Levitt here with me, and he is one of the pioneers of founding molecular simulations as a field. And we have him today, and we're going to discuss a bit about where the field has been, how it's progressed, and where it's heading today. So we can start a bit with the, yeah, how everything started, Mike. You can pretty much tell us how, how did the, this, uh, this journey start for you? Well, Iman, it's, it's great to be here. I, I love uh, Sweden, and uh, at least it's light outside, so you were, that's, that's very positive. Um, so it started a long time ago, you know, close to 50 years ago. It started, I think, it, in, I thought it started by accident, but I think it was actually directed by some very powerful people who knew where this should go. And the idea was basically that once we saw protein molecules had very detailed structures, it suddenly became why. It's not like grains of sand on the beach, we know why they're random. We had to understand the forces that stabilize proteins. And that was the initial impetus. We started with minimization, normal modes, then molecular dynamics was an obvious thing. And, you know, that is now 40 years ago that we've been doing simulations of various kinds. Simulation normally means molecular dynamics, but I think simulation should include all the different techniques, Monte Carlo, normal modes, minimization, other techniques are all part of simulation. Uh, so it started a long time ago. In those days, computers were very, very weak, something like 10 to the 10 times less powerful than today. And as a result, we had to make things very simple. Uh, I guess we got the simplifications right because they're still being used today, which is scary. And when you started, you had, I mean, the application areas were limited due to, due to the computational power you had. And as you mentioned, you worked with a lot of different techniques, a uh, big uh, spectrum of techniques, actually. So I, I think a wide range of techniques is very important because no matter where you are, you never really have enough... Well, if, if you could do a calculation just like an experiment, you'd still have to do all the analysis. So it really wouldn't be any better than doing an experiment. So I think we always have to think about clever ways to capture the essence in terms of simplification or find methods that avoid injecting noise that you then take out and so on. So I think broad techniques are... are there. It, surprisingly, although it was very early in the business, the problems that we're sort of facing was one was how our protein folds. So this is a problem which is still with us. Another problem was how do enzymes work? And again, that one, I think, has been solved to a large extent, thanks to computation. Um, often the computation is more quantum mechanical than, than, than molecular mechanical. Um, and then in between, there's a whole range of issues. But it, right at the very beginning, it was clear we were worried about uh, you know, sequence giving rise to structure and structure giving rise to function. Um, other issues which I think were more studied by physical chemists in those days were things like pure liquids. Water simulations were only done about the same time. You know, so we were actually did, I think we did a calculation on a protein before one had really been done on water, which is kind of amazing. But people were worried about solid, solidization, free energies and things like that. So I think the problems have been with us for a long time. It's just taken a very long time to show that you could do something more useful. Now what's really you know, impressive with this field, according to me at least, is that it's not just you know, one expertise that is needed. People have to know biophysics, and computer science, chemistry. There's a mixture of different fields, physics, that made this uh, realizable. But I guess in the beginning it was also a lot of theoreticians that used this and experiments was pretty much orthogonal, whereas today it's starting to merge. Yeah, I, I think what's happened that has been very important is that these, these techniques have been come... So firstly, you're right, they're very multidisciplinary. I have a joke slide where I say we use methods of maths and computer science with forces from physics applied to molecules in chemistry to biology and medicine. I probably left something out. It's good for the economy and the rest of the world or something. <laughs> but basically, you could hit every single thing, and it's sort of true. Um, I personally like that because I have very wide interests in this way. You know, I, you do many different things, maybe you're not an expert in any of them. Um, but I think greatly today, um, these methods are very, very widespread. They've become really accepted. There was a long time when computing was the ugly little sister of, of biology. That's no longer the case. 
Uh, and because they become widespread, they are used more broadly, and often by people who are not experts or experienced at a particular technique. Yeah, so, I mean, in life science, it's probably gradu gradually becoming more biologist, or, I mean, the application expert that is starting to look at this, because they know the biological system, they have the questions, and they want to apply it with one of these yeah. techniques. And in your uh, perspective, what are the, the biggest achievements so far? And what do you see? Well, I think just to relate to that, that first point, I think that if you think about a particular problem, um, for example, now we are trying to work on the ribosome. So calculating, doing calculations on the ribosome is hard, but it's trivial compared to reading the literature on the ribosome, which is incredibly hard. There are probably 100,000 papers. Uh, you know, people who have been doing this for all their lives really know it. So what one really needs to do is either team up with what I call a domain expert, somebody who's doing experimentals. Or else have the experimentalist do the calculation. And the calculations don't really care what atoms they're working on. They don't care what system they're working on. Uh, so the, the programs are much less domain specific than the experimental knowledge is. But I think it's definitely clear that any of these problems need to be linked to experimentalists who have a lot of experience in knowing where the hard questions are. Uh, I also think for the computer person, it's a lot of fun to have this interaction. So again, I was lucky that all my life I was never in a purely theoretical department. I was always in the departments of people solving problems. And therefore, someone would say, is DNA stiff or flexible? It's a hard thing to measure, but a calculation maybe can be useful. So I think that is very, very important to, to have this interaction. Now, I think today, what has happened is that more and more, as the programs have become more widespread, easy to use, more and more the actual biologist is taking the program and using it. And that I think is also very, very good. Yeah, that's very, very, I mean, good for, good for the field of molecular simulations, you could say, because it's no, more, no longer a niche area. It's starting to spread and more people are trying to use it. But as the complexity of the problems increase, you need more types of different experts. And also, you need more computational power. And there are a lot of different initiatives that try to you know, make this, uh, these applications accessible and you know, share the knowledge and make sure that uh, people can use them for applications of a relevant problem scope and uh, yeah, so forth. And they, these, these are probably being done in each and every continent. And uh, what do you think their role is? Well, I think the applications, I mean, I, I would say the applications are increasingly bug-free. In other words, not only that, they probably also check the data. So it's, it's harder to do really stupid things, uh, one would hope, with, without knowing about it. So the, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the expertise was needed to sort of navigate through buggy codes. I'm pretty sure that all the codes are now pretty much bug-free. The parameter sets, if there's a missing parameter, most programs will say missing parameter and not use the wrong parameter, stuff like this. I think this has been very, very important. Um, computers are such that you can now run quite large significant calculations. I think the hard part is when you want to do calculations that are sort of off the beaten path. And I still believe that there's lots of different ways of doing these calculations. It's not simply a question of starting with a crystal structure and running it for a certain amount of computer time and then analyzing the results. There are other things you can do. Those things require more expertise. So I think there's definitely still room for, certainly on the harder problems, for a collaboration between a computer person or a simulationist and an experimentalist. Uh, in other cases, I think experimentalists can actually do very variable calculations themselves. And you know, one thing that's interesting about experiments, especially in biology, and one of the really big achievements of the field, is that they're very, very good at worrying about controls and statistics. Because if you want to ask whether a certain cell line is toxic or not, you've got to be very, very careful. So biologists, by their nature, are really good at looking at very messy systems. And sometimes these computer systems are very, very messy. So a, a good experiment would say, OK, you've got this calculation. Now let's see what happens if. And they will do a control. And that can be very, very helpful. Uh, I know in, this is something which I mean, should have been very obvious, but it was only sort of in my mid-career when we were doing a certain 
test on seeing if we could fold proteins, and the results looked interesting. But it was hard to tell whether they were significant. And then I think my, my student at the time had the idea, let's just randomize the sequence. And as soon as we randomized the sequence, all the signal went away, and we were thrilled. But I mean, we never thought it was necessary, because we knew it was there. But still, when we saw that the signal did depend on having the correct sequence, we were very excited. So there's these kinds of tests are very, very important, and I think experimental biologists are really, really good at doing this. So I think one area that we can learn from them is how you do clean experiments on very messy systems. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you often try to do things off the beaten path. And in science, you pretty much, that's more the rule that you try to do something that is off the beaten path. Um, and start, uh, you know, want to address larger, uh, larger problem areas that nobody still I, explores. I think it's a personality issue. I think, you know, in, 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 if you look at people, there are people who walk on the beaten path and people who like to walk off the beaten path. Um, I think it's just my personality. I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I know that uh, earlier on people would say my grants are very unfocused. And off the beaten path you know, there's a lack of focus. I mean, I think you need both things. It's just that uh, I'm very happy to do things where I don't know where I'm going. And being off the beaten path is, by definition, there's no path. But I think equally well, there are, there are other areas where you need both things. I'm not saying one is better, but I think personally, you know, I, I've enjoyed that breadth, and, and it's probably even getting wider than it used to be. It's pretty wide, so. And as you mentioned also, there is a lot of other fields, such as like experimentalists that have a wide knowledge of how to validate something or do a, do a type of anti-thesis checking. And, uh, you know, it's difficult, for example, if you're sitting in a theoretical department, who should you contact to get this yeah. type of stuff? You know, you know, you need to establish a collaboration to get this multidisciplinary... Well, I think also uh, there's, there's, it's, it's necessary to establish trust. Um, you know, a, a typical experimentalist approached by a random theoretician would say, oh God, this is, this, I don't even understand what this guy's talking about. He's talking about correlation functions and this and this and this. I grew up, and I did my PhD in an experimental lab. I was always in experimental labs. Right now at Stanford, I'm the only theoretician in a lab of 10 faculty. So at least that way they trust me. I mean, they, maybe they don't trust me, but they know me. And it works both ways. I actually have uh, the two projects I'm working on right now. One involves a collaboration uh, on RNA polymerase with Roger Kornberg, and he knows that system backwards. The other is a much more difficult problem. It involves a collaboration with another faculty member, Jody Puglisi, on the ribosome. Now, he, is, he just knows the ribosome really, really well. And one of the problems is, is when you have a very complicated simulation, how do you bring the experimentalists into it? And we've actually got very involved in, in virtual reality. So we have a couple of Oculus Rifts. And the idea was, we haven't really succeeded very much, but you could, make, you could walk into the system. And the great thing would be is that you know, the, the, the domain expert next to you would say, gee, that, that you know, nucleotide that's moving a lot, that's really interesting. Which one is it? And then, you know, he'd look at it and say, oh, wow. At a meeting I went to three weeks ago, somebody said that's a very important thing for this function. So this is something you'd never be able to find by any kind of literature search. So you're able to sort of... But it, it, this project is... Uh, you know, we, we sort of got it working, but all, all that virtual reality stuff is still uh, a little bit early. It hasn't really hit prime time yet. Yeah, and I guess actually in, in you know, many labs these days, uh, they're very good at combining you know, theory with the experimental. But there are many more that probably wants to do this transition. And I mean, for example, in this building, there is a wide variety of ex experimentalists and uh, theoreticians. But if you look at this at a larger scale, on a continental scale or a global scale, where you want to make these connections, um, I don't know if these big initiatives help. I mean, the researchers are very good at collaborating still, but is there anything that can you know, well, make I, the push so you can make a bigger leap there? So I think there are two ways of going. A lot of, uh, of the young people today, maybe not so much in, in biological simulation, but say in bioinformatics, are doing experiments and calculations themselves. I think that's good. I think that probably only works when the experiments, which often just involve a sequencing machine, uh, are relatively easy. I still think that collaboration... The great thing about collaboration is, is that it's a, a meeting of two minds. 
If I meet somebody who's been working on say, a membrane system all his life, his, his brain is just teeming with this. And I can interact with him. And that is really, it gets really, really exciting. So I, I still believe, you know, we don't want everyone to become a mixed theoretician experimentalist. We still want specialization. I think collaboration between people who have specializations that are different always leads to more than just having two people who are both doing the same things. So I think that's still going to be important. I think collaborations, you know, one of the really nice things today is that uh, because of the internet and, and uh, it's very accessible. It's very, very accessible. In fact, this morning my wife phoned me up on FaceTime without, without, the temp, without the picture. And the sound quality is better than any international call I think I've had in the last five years. She was eating her breakfast and said, wow, you know, I can actually taste it. <laughs> and she called me on FaceTime and said, there's an answer. You know, there's, there's all these other channels. So I'm just saying these things can be very, very powerful. I think that uh, the key thing is to have a wide net. The reason you want to have... Uh, an international kind of center is that you're able to capture a broader sense of people. As I said, the key thing here is collaboration between people who are not the same. They've got to have enough in common that they have a common. But even that, I would say that they that can be on a high scale biology, and then for example. Yeah. But it has to be quite different. If you have people who are very similar, then it maybe seems easier. It goes well at the beginning, but the potential gain is less. So I think you want to be able to have. Uh, you know, a broad capture area. And then, of course, bring in uh, experimentalists as needed. I think it can be very, very powerful. Yeah. And the last uh, thought we would like you to share with us, what do you think, you know, from today and onwards, what are the greatest challenges that we can, uh, you know, try to address and hopefully solve? And what time scale do you think we can solve them? I mean, using both computational and exper experimental techniques together. So I would say there's a general challenge which we make progress on but needs to be solved in a more specific one. So I would say the general challenge is, is that it's quite easy to generate a simulation. We can generate big data any size you want. But actually analyzing, so making a movie is, is always easy and not, not trivial, but a good movie is a hard thing to make. But it's one way, but it isn't, it isn't enough. We need to find various ways of analysis, analyzing these things. As I said, virtual reality might be useful, different ways of analyzing numerically, different projections of the space, etc. I think that's something which is going to get better. I think there needs to be maybe more emphasis placed on improved analysis methods. Um, I think the, for me, the big challenges are systems where they're so big that, for example, uh, a ribosome in a box of water is something like more than a million particles, maybe two million particles. And what makes it so hard is that, firstly, there's just a lot of data. But secondly, it's a lot of noise. So you need to understand how you reduce degrees of freedom. And I think one of the big challenges in any mechanistic study, we don't want to find motion. We want to find functionally important motion. And, you know, most biologists think in terms of a reaction coordinate, you know, go from products, you know, reacting to product and it's one dimensional. So one dimension might be too simple. When you look at very complicated systems, they actually have a two dimensional picture. But we're taking a, a space which might be six million dimensional, like you know, Rabbit's Mobile, and projecting it down to two. And we don't know yet how to do that very, very well. So I think there's real challenges in choosing the right reduced sets of degrees of freedom. Um, and I think that's a very general challenge. So I think that uh, also on these very large systems, we have to find a way to reduce the noise. Um, we, we, you know, you, you can't run a full ribosome simulation for enough computer time to get rid of all the uh, noise. So we have to try and do the calculation in ways that don't generate the noise in the first case. And these, these are techniques which I don't know we have the answer for. Um, but I think are interesting. And I think that uh, these machines are really interesting because they have moving parts. And, and it's not just the, the movement, it, it's, it's productive movement. Um, when you think about uh, a molecule vibrating, it's vibrating because it has no choice. When a ribosome does what it's doing, it's, it's part of the action. So uh, it's very interesting. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. And we hope you have a great continued stay here in Sweden. Thank you very much, Jumann. It was really nice talking to you. Thank you.